Welcome all of you to our service. It's lovely to have you here today. It's warmer out here than it is out there, which is good thing. <laughs> so it's, we've got a lovely circle service today. We're delighted to welcome Tom as our speaker from America, joining us for a few weeks on guest speaker today. We're going to start, first of all, with um, For the Beauty of the Earth. Because um, it's been such a glorious spring, we've got all these colours and sunshine, even if we've got a chilly wind today. So we thought we'd stand up and sing that as a gusty sort of welcome song to the service. give thanks for being here today, for the journeys that have brought us here, 
and recognize that it is a coming together of heart and mind, of body and soul, in recognition of the one presence and one power in which we live and move and breathe. And for this knowing and this coming together, we give grateful thanks. Amen. Amen. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, I will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. I am free right where I am. I'd like to, to begin with that. I am free right where I am. freedom with mind, body and soul. Because the unlimited spirit that we are can never be bound by outer conditions. One cannot bind peace, joy or love. We express the gifts of the spirit with every thought of forgiveness, every moment spent with a friend, and every word of kindness. As we share our gifts, we experience liberation. I am free right where I am. And the Bible quotation from Galatians for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. For you were called to freedom. So I'd like you just to spend a few moments thinking about what freedom means to you. And you'd like to put anything down your holding and close your eyes. And just feel any of the words from the daily word struck you. We are in feelings about freedom. Passage 
that Patricia's going to read for us. Um, I want to in welcome again Tom. Tom is someone that I met um, in about 2004 or five, six. six, was it? Might have been five, but I think it was six. six. In 2006, Tom came over here to the UK and um, started a wonderful journey of inspiration and love and wisdom and sharing with uh, his American love of us and our love for him as well and we always delight in having him over. It's been four years since he's been here but we were so delighted that Tom was happy to come back again and join us. Does anyone not know Tom? There's a few. Surely you don't, do you? No. Yeah. Pleased to meet you. Well, do, have, do stay and have a chat afterwards and get to know him because there is so much in this man that is just, you know, who blesses us all really. But, uh, and, and you bless mine, you know that. <laughs> yes. The resurrection of the dead. Now if Christ is proclaimed as, as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. It's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 22. You brought that alive, my friend. You really did. You, you brought it alive. It's quite a story, isn't it? And it is pure Paul. Paul argues like an attorney uh, so often. And here he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And you'll note that he was not referring only to Jesus' resurrection. He was referring to the resurrection of all people which was a strong debate in his time. There were two major parties and other minor parties among the Jewish people. There were the Pharisees who believed in this relatively new concept of resurrection. You see, earlier on, Jewish life hadn't thought much about it. They were, Judaism was and is very much focused on life here and life now. But there was this expansion, if you will, and a thought of um, resurrection from the dead. And notice, notice that we hear that the dead have been raised, not that they rose. It wasn't as though uh, people were climbing out of graves like zombies. We're going to look today at what exactly that term resurrection means. It doesn't mean necessarily what we think it does. And let me uh, say at this point before going farther that everybody's entitled to his or, own, his or her own beliefs. I share a perspective. Please feel free to disagree with it. Please feel free to question it. And we can, even if we're willing, dance together and, and see if we can both learn. Uh, there was an Anglican bishop who proudly proclaimed that the bones of Jesus got up and walked out of that tomb. And for many people, resurrection means something else. Something else entirely. By the way, the Pharisees believed in resurrection, and there was another party, the Sadducees, you may have heard from them, who denied resurrection. They said there is no resurrection. And it's potentially to the Sadducee point of view that Paul was speaking. And it's been said by people who love to make puns, that the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection and that is why they were sad, you see. <laughs> you, you've got to work with the material at hand. <laughs> so, the question then is what exactly 
is the form in which people are raised. So to address this question, we go to a thought by John Dominic Crossan, a very prominent uh, biblical scholar in America. Well, he's Irish, actually, but he's been living in America for most of his life. He was a Roman Catholic monk until he left uh, the monastery through the proper channels. He, became, he, be, he remains a believing Roman Catholic. He was a friend of Marcus Borg. The two of them worked together. Their perspectives complemented each other beautifully. He points to the Hellenization of the Western world. Alexander the Great, you know, conquered the known world, and he brought his culture with him, a culture with which he thought was the finest in the world, far surpassing everything else. And that culture affected Judaism. Before Alexander, there was the, the ancient Judaism. After Alexander, we have that in contention with Hellenized Judaism. Many among the Jewish community resisted Hellenization. They wanted to keep their old ways. This is important to our discussion because uh, in ancient Judaism, an individual was conceived as a body quickened by spirit. This is the kind of creation that we see portrayed in Genesis chapter 2 where God forms Adam from the dust of the ground and breathes into him the breath of life. So, people who have this view of what a human is are called by Crossan sarcophilic, which means they love the body, and they see the body irreparably or irretrievably, uh, irrevocably joined to the soul. The two are one. After Alexander, we have a new point of view introduced, and that is that a human being is spirit temporarily using a body as a vehicle to move around the earth. Some forms later became uh, convinced that the body itself, in indeed all flesh, was uh, not desirable. It was something to be cast off and cast off willingly. Flesh, in fact, was almost evil. And if we look at the Christian tradition down through the centuries, indeed down through the millennia, we see this ambivalence of attitude uh, toward the body. The ancient Jews had none of this. They celebrated the body. They rejoiced in it. As a matter of fact, it was a man's duty to pleasure his wife every Sabbath. It wasn't just something that would be nice if you'd like to. It had to be done. It was required. And eating and drinking are a part of the Jewish way of life, a part of celebration. Indeed, a Jewish man is not considered a man until he takes a wife. Before that point, he is a boy. You see the difference, the stark difference, and some would even say a dismal difference as the Christian tradition dawns. So. Here we are. And Paul tells us, as all die in Adam, we will be made alive in Christ. Now, Adam, his name, means from the dust. In other words, dirt man. Okay? So as we all die in Adam, we are made alive in Christ. So, the, the ancients, the ones who see the individual as a body quickened by spirit, the <coughs> sarcophilix, and the Hellenized Jews, the Hellenized people indeed, are sarcophobics. They view the body in a different perspective. All right? So we go down in this first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, and we begin to look at what the resurrected body is. But before we go there, you could reasonably ask, if you're going to talk about resurrection and you're going to use scripture, why on earth didn't you use a passage from one of the Gospels? And the reason for that is that the Gospels come along much, much later. Paul's writing began about the year 50, and the first of the Gospels probably appeared in 70 or 75, and that would have been Mark. So listen to Paul talk about uh, the resurrected body. Remember that Paul 
is a Hellenized Jew. Paul was a, a Pharisee. Uh, he could be called a rabbi. Today's Judaism is a descendant of Pharisaic Judaism. Uh, Paul could be called a rabbi. He was also a Roman citizen. He had a classical education. He was quite a, uh, um, an amazingly well-rounded man. So he asks, he says rather, beginning in verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there's one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. Let me stop there. The glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. Indeed, star differs from star in glory. <coughs> Paul likes to give lots of detail. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So we'll stop there for a moment. It is sown in dishonor. He would say dishonor because flesh that is buried decays. That's what all flesh does. It's really a reverent process of giving back to the earth the elements from which the body was created, yes? It is sown in weakness. Well, what is weaker than something that appears dead? It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, what on earth is a spiritual body? Well, Paul continues, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of the dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. So we're looking now at the process of resurrection as Paul sees it. And notice, he uses the word has been raised. Not that the individual raises himself or herself, but they are raised by the activity of God. And this is resurrection, not a, a, a carcass climbing out of a tomb, but rather a new dimension of life into which we enter at this time that we call resurrection. Do you see? What about the appearances of those who uh, claims to the appearance the, that uh, those who have claimed to see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, a talk of? Well, it's interesting. The word in Greek is "ophthe," which uh, I don't know how well I'm pronouncing that. It's a transliteration, which means a perception that is not a physical perception. If I see an automobile in the street. I have to believe that it is a physical perception. But this is the kind of seeing that is not done with physical eyes. So is there a resurrection? Well, I believe there is. Is it a physical resurrection? 
I believe it is not. Is it less powerful because it is not physical? Well, I will tell you that I believe it is far more powerful because it is not physical. Does the physical body rise? I don't think so. I think the elements of this earth are returned to it to be used again. And in that sense, you could say that the physical body rises, but not as the body which was sown. Everything on this earth has been recycled time after time after time. I like to say that when I drink a glass of water, I don't want to pause too long to think about where this water has been. Because the amount of water on the earth is constant between the time the earth was cooled and now. It just keeps going round again. And so it is with the cells of our bodies. We give them back to the earth, another soul uses them to build another body. So that's the view of resurrection. Now, is the resurrection a myth or a reality? My only answer to that question can be yes. Okay? It is a myth. It has to be a myth because it cannot be explained in terms of hard scientific fact. A myth is a story that contains truth, but doesn't contain it in an empirically factual way. You see. And that is why the resurrection is a myth. Why is it that the resurrection stories in the Bible have this whole idea of the garden tomb and Jesus walking out of the tomb? Well, they are put in a context to tell a story. I am coming to a realization, for me at least, that the entirety of each of the Gospels is its own parable. People in recent times have searched for verification of physical details and they are missing the point entirely. Do we really want to ask whether or not the cow really did jump over the moon and what sort of cow it was, all right? And uh, whether it was a difficult journey and what happened to the cow on the way? No, we know that there is a meaning beyond the, the rhyme. He diddle diddle the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. You see? And just so, there is a meaning behind the story of Jesus walking out of that tomb in the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are not the only Gospels, by the way. They are the ones that made it into the Bible. They made the cut. In the Gospel of Peter, we see Jesus walking out of the tomb, but the cross is behind him, and the cross is talking. So, that's it for me. The resurrection story is a reality. It is a story about being raised to a new form of life and uh, it is a, a myth in the highest sense of the word. Culture is built around myths. It is not built around empirical evidence because always for us there will be that which the what rational mind cannot prove and only the subjective mind can truly receive and accept. Please make yourself comfortable. There's a little poem that you probably know, it's been going through my mind for weeks, so I'll share it with you. I am the place where God shines through. For he and I are one, not two. I needn't worry, fret, or plan. He wants me where and as I am. And if I stay relaxed and free, he'll carry out his work through me. Seems quite appropriate as we're talking freely. So let's do the other thing and relax. Let the floor take the weight of your legs and feet comfortably together there the chair supporting your back and let all the tension go from your arms and shoulders from the muscles around your neck your scalp all tension gone from your eyes and your mouth together we take a deep breath So 
when we relax, our abdomen and all our body. And now we take any concerns or preoccupations or puzzles that we've been holding in thought and perhaps lay them gently on the floor beside our feet where we can pick them up later. And now we're left with just those stray feelings which we hand over in the process of meditation. Sometimes using different methods. Recently we did a Buddhist method of loving kindness and today let's take a line from A Course in Miracles which says I call upon the name of God and my name. So give God a name. might be Father, might be Holy Spirit, it may be loving presence, I might say, O oh Father and Michael, great power and care, loving, carer and man. For a moment, rest in the silence using the focus of the name of God as a way of letting go and calling into reality our own true nature as wise whole deeply deeply loved perfect in every way. that these gifts go forth to be blessed and multiplied by all who receive them and pass them on. And they come back to this community in expected and unexpected blessings. We give thanks. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
right, well, let's, let's do um, our peace song and then the first of protection to close it, shall we? Mm -hmm. Just uh, can most people remember the words because I think they're hiding behind the banner.